Hello, my name is Lacey Sheldon and I am a librarian at the McIntosh Memorial Library in Viroqua. And today we're having a special guest presentation by Mr. Rice Spann of the Valley Stewardship Network. And Rice takes care of a very important uh, trainings that are offered through the Valley Stewardship Network. Um, is it yearly, Rice? Yearly, usually. Yearly. Great. Except so for COVID years. <laughs> <laughs> and we will dive into that. Um, so the Water Action Volunteer Training, this is a, dis we'll be discussing that today. Um, Rice is going to be showing us a slideshow. And um, yeah, I guess uh, we will dive in. Uh, Rice, if you'd like to um, pick it up from here and you can let us know about your program today. Thanks for being oh. here. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Lacey, for inviting me over to, uh, or inviting me on to Zoom today to talk to everyone about the WAVE program. And uh, we at Valley Storeship Network has been involved in the WAVE program since almost the beginning of the organization. So it's going been going on for about 20 years. And like you say, uh, the WAVE volunteers, the Water Action volunteers, they um, go out and monitor from May till October. So uh, we usually have a training at the end of April each year. Last year, we, unfortunately, we weren't able to. Mm -hmm. We're excited to get folks back outside. And it is something that is very safe, um, you know, as far as the virus goes, to be outside and connecting with, with your local stream. So that's, that's mm -hmm. good. Um, so yeah, these, these trainings are coming right up. Yeah. Um, a week from today will be the first one in the evening. We, we've partnered with the West Fork Sportsman's Club, our sports club mm -hmm. avalanche, and uh, they've kindly allowed us to use that outdoor space on the West Fork, which is ideal. And we'll have one session on Wednesday and then follow up with another on Saturday. And you can go to either one. You don't need to go to both, though, if you were uh, um, excited about attending both, that's fine too. I think it could probably fit you in, but we'll, we'll have to just see with our numbers, um, trying to keep the classes very small. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, Lacey said, I'd like to share some slides to talk about the WAVE program. So I'm gonna jump to that now and share my screen. Thanks, Rice, and I'll let the uh, um, everyone who's watching know that after following Rice's um, slideshow, then we will be hearing briefly from Nan Marshall of Valley Stewardship Network, and then we'll be uh, taking some time for question and answer as well. Great. Well, the, the Valley Stewardship Network uh, works to protect our land and waters through research, education, and community empowerment. And once again, we're really happy to be partnering with the library for this talk and several more this month. Mm -hmm. so, um, you can, uh, we'll uh, announce the rest of our, our uh, talks later on in this session. Mm -hmm. This is a picture here, just uh, a stream, you know, rolling through. Mm -hmm. uh, meadow here and uh, seeing the rolling driftless hills in the background and just the crystal clear water. We have, you know, we are just so fortunate here. We have uh, just amazing natural uh, resources. And uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's something that I know I, I care about. And I'm sure you all tuning in care about too. Um, it's a lot, of, you know, it's people, it's, Many people grew up here and just have fond memories and, and love fishing and outdoor um, mm -hmm. opportunities we have. And, and other people move here just because of the, the natural beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Storeship Network is, is glad to yeah, partner with landowners and community members and, and, you know, for these, the research, education and community empowerment. Water Action Volunteer Program is a statewide program. It's uh, 
It's a partnership with the DNR, as well as the department, the uh, University of Wisconsin Cooperative Extension, and local groups like Valley Stewardship, the Valley Stewardship Network, work uh, you know across the state. This is a photo from one of our trainings a few years back on the West Fork. These are the watersheds that Valley Stewardship Network works in. You can see uh, we are located, our, our office is in Vernon County in, in Main Street of Barova, but we also work in Richland, Monroe, La Crosse, and parts of If uh, folks out there, Lacey, want to, they can uh, look at this map and see if you can figure out what watershed you live in. Viroqua is located, I don't know if you can see, can you see my cursor here? Yes, we can. Okay, I think Viroqua is right around the dividing line. It's, it, we're on a ridge here in Viroqua, and so mm -hmm. uh, part of town drains into the, the Kickapoo, and then on the mm -hmm. west town, the drains into the bad acts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, we have somebody in the audience knowing that they are in the Kickapoo River okay. side of things. I personally would say my family would have, our family farms would have been in the bad axe River watershed. Yep. Mm -hmm. so that's interesting. If anyone else out there knows which watershed that they're living in, you could always put that in the chat and I can let Rice know as we go along here. I could spend so much time looking at maps like this. <laughs> yeah, no, that is a really cool map. So great. So the WAVE program is uh, statewide and uh, there's over 500 people 500 citizen scientists, volunteers from across the state that are heading out each year, which is pretty. Mm -hmm. and, and right here um, with the Valley Storeship Network, we have approximately 50 people uh, that are out usually monitoring every year. Oh. Some of the, the goals for the WAVE program um, to increase understanding of watersheds and water quality. Mm -hmm to build relationships with volunteers and uh, collecting high quality data and, and getting that data entered in to the, where, where the data that we are out in the field collecting gets put into the DNR's website and uh, it's accessible by anyone, you know, volunteers, scientists, the DNR. So uh, um, decision makers for local towns and, and counties. And uh, you'll see your data right in there next to uh, you know, a DNR scientist who is out in the field as well. So it's, it's really um, valued and uh, it's great that it's accessible. These are the, oh wait, let me see. I had a couple more other things. Yeah, some of the other reasons to get involved is just, um, you know, it's a great way to connect to uh, your, a stream that's running through your property or uh, your favorite fishing spot. Uh, it's just a lot of fun to have a, you know, a regular visit each month to a, a special place and through May, May through October anyway. Um, you're going to learn about, you know, the local aquatic life in, in the stream. Um, and, uh, you, you have a, a part in choosing this, this stream as well. It could be something, it has to be something that has, you know, a flow year round, but, uh, you know, it could be something that you can jump across or it could be something <laughs> that's, uh, you know, more like the West Fork. It's got to be weightable. We, we want people in safe situations. So like, for instance, the, the main branch of the Kickapoo is not probably not a good spot for, for uh, volunteers to be out on because you can't really wade across that stream. 
these are the components that the, the volunteers are going to, you know, we'll be doing the training on uh, a week from today and on a week from Saturday. And these are the components that the WAVE um, volunteers will be trained in. Temperature, pretty straightforward. Transparency, the clarity of the water. Dissolved oxygen, stream flow, habitat index, and the biotic index. I'm gonna go through each of those now. So temperature is pretty straightforward. Um, I was gonna say that, uh, you know, some of these, yeah, seem, seem straightforward. Th this program has been going on for, I think it started in 1996. So uh, they've really honed it so that lay people can uh, understand and um, uh, it, it's just so accessible. You, you mainly need to know how to, you know, move a thermometer, use a tape measure, stopwatch, and uh, you know, everything's step by step, everything's laid out so that uh, it's very easy to follow and uh, not, not intimidating. You know, in the beginning, it, it might seem that way, but uh, you'll see that it's very accessible to, for everyone to learn. So yeah, once again, the temperature, you re we're using a thermometer. Uh, and it's gonna be in Celsius, so that, <laughs> that's a little bit different, but beyond that, it's uh, pretty straightforward. We wanna take the air temperature as well as the water temperature. And why that's important, um, because uh, as there's, uh, if, if the, as the temperature in the water warms up, there's less oxygen available. But at the same time, the, there's a higher um, metabolic rate for the living creatures in the water. So they're needing more oxygen precisely when there's less available. So as you can see, it can create a lot of stress when uh, we have temperature fluctuations. So it's, it's uh, important to keep, keep track of that. Transparency, um, that's the water clarity. And uh, it's um, yeah, the color as well as clarity. The organisms, fish and insects, and, and uh, as well as the plant life are adapted to what the baseline is for that stream. What, what has been the baseline is, is the conditions that have been um, most common you know, for the last, you know, for a long time. So uh, it, as that changes, um, you get, you know, if you do get turbidity in the water, that'll block light, which is problematic. It re reduces visibility for uh, fish that, that are sight feeders looking for um, their meals. It irritates fish's gills, it uh, covers habitat. So you can see why it's, it's important to, um, measure transparency. How we do that is using a clear tube that you can see the, the person on the, the right hand side of the screen, he's looking down through a clear tube through a column of water that's a, it's 120 centimeters tall. And there's a target on the bottom of it that's a black and white clear target. And uh, the person that's kneeling down is releasing water and uh, so many times our, our streams are so crystal clear here that you can see through 120 centimeters of water right from the get-go. And that'll, that'll be your recording. But um, on other streams, you might not have quite that clarity. If there's been a recent rain event, it might be lower. So uh, those things are um, what are being measured and it's, as you can see, you can, you can do it on your own, but it's usually easier to have a partner. And uh, the person on the top is out collecting with the tube. They've just filled it up midstream. And uh, then there's, yeah, a couple um, samples of uh, 
couple examples of people looking down through that that column of water to to see the measure the clarity. Hmm. Oh, I see. This is a school group. We've got a small stream here in the area and they were measuring uh, transparency that, that day. You can see this, the man with his uh, turned around in the foreground there is, is filling up the tube. Not really ideal situation because he's, he's got a lot of people standing around him. They might be stirring up the water and it might, <laughs> might cause the accuracy to be not as high. You, you would want to be the furthest person upstream when you're gathering a, a sample. But. Okay, dissolved oxygen. Let's see, well, yeah, just like um, we need oxygen, so do the um, organisms in the water and uh, how it gets into the water is uh, through, you, when you see a little waterfall or water tumbling over rocks in, in, the, in a stream and the riffles, um, that, that can get air mixed in with the water. Also, uh, just as trees um, have a, um, through photosynthesis, they'll release oxygen in, you know, for, into the atmosphere plants underwater release oxygen as well. So it's, it's, um, it's something that's fluctuating, the, the amount of uh, um, oxygen in the water, but uh, a healthy stream is going to have, it's gonna be more stable. When, and a less healthy stream is gonna have crashes, peaks and crashes because they have a lot of, um, um, you know, algae blooms and things like that can cause the oxygen to crash, um, especially in the evening. So uh, how we test for the, um, the level of dissolved oxygen, we have what is called a, a hot kit, which looks like something out of your high school chemistry lab. And the, the person of that blue little um, box in the bigger picture there is a picture of the kit. And it's got um, a sample bottle, which is, there's a, a yellow liquid in a bottle on the top. And that's um, a, a sample that was collected from the stream and, and uh, different reagents. There's three reagents that we add to it. And there's a process for mixing it. And, and then on the bottom, the final step is taking the, um, the sample that you've that you've made and you're adding drip by drip another chemical into it and waiting for a color change. And that number of drops will indicate how much oxygen is in the water. So it's, it's, um, it's got several steps and, but like I say, there's, there's a really uh, great um, data sheet that you'll be filling out and it has step by step instructions and of course in, in our trainings we'll go through how to uh, you know you'll get hands-on experience on the stream checking the level of dissolved oxygen with an ex myself or another experienced volunteer to help you okay stream flow this is, uh, this is important because um, it's a link between the, the land use, uh, what's going on uh, is, you know, when you have more impervious cover, for instance, um, that does not allow the water to percolate into the ground and um, it's not gonna be recharging our aquifers that you know, feed our watersheds causing stream flow to be reduced. Um, when there's a lot of uh, high capacity wells could be an issue in an area. Um, there's different reasons why 
um, stream flow could be affected by what we're doing on, on the land. So, but it's important to, to monitor. How we do that is um, we, it's, it is uh, some, some serious calculus that, that takes place, but uh, it's okay. I don't remember calculus either. Um, you don't, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have some very straightforward uh, worksheets you do need to, to know how to use a tape measure and uh, a stopwatch. So what we're doing, what, what they're doing in this picture is um, measure, trying to figure out the area of one slice of the creek. So they've measured across the creek. They have got the, the, the top um, measurement of the water and then they're taking the depth every foot all the way across. And we, um, the wave data sheet has a place to fill in all these numbers, breaking up your stream foot by foot, and uh, and you'll be able to calculate the area of that one thin slice of the stream. And then you'll take another point 20 feet up and you will time floating a ball down across 20 feet of the stream. And Getting that, uh, the speed of the, the ball flo floating down the stream and by, by having a known distance, you can, you can get uh, feet per second of the, of the object. So you have that the speed of the water and the area of one, uh, say, slice of the water, if that makes sense. Having those two uh, known um, data points, you feed that into an equation and that will give you the gallons per minute of that, uh, or um, I'm trying to think of what the actual unit of measure is, if it's gallons per second. Um, I can't think of it on the top of my head. But once again, it's it's something that uh, we just feed in the numbers. It has a step-by-step -step approach. And um, this this one is really nice with two people. They, you know, in these we see in these photos, there's three or more working together. And three is nice. <laughs> I've heard of people that have done it on their own. And that can be tricky with the stopwatch and you're, you're tossing a ball upstream and, <laughs> and, and uh, watching it past one point and then another point 20 feet down. But it's really nice with, uh, it's great to work with other people. Once again, this could be your family, your neighbors, uh, or, or it could be someone you meet through your training that, that is interested in working on uh, one site together. So that is Streamflow. All right, this is Biotic Index. This is everyone's favorite, or usually. And this is, uh, yeah, measuring the, what many people call the uh, macroinvertebrates in the water, the, the, the stream bugs. And why this is so important important or, or useful is that, uh, you, you know, some of these other things that we've been talking about, the temperature, the stream flow, the, the oxygen, you know, those are measurements that we are taking, you know, one moment of one day and they're important and they're, they help us establish a baseline of what's going on in a uh, stream. But what, you know, what we see as far as um, the type of insects and uh, other life in the water, th those are, are living organisms, organisms that are there, you know, for most of the year. So uh, they are, they're not mobile. They're, they're, they're constantly, um, you know, um, 
you know, if they're if they're missing, then that's a sign that uh, even though, like I say, that you might have crystal clear water on that day, there might be an issue that the biotic index is going to show that the, you know uh, it's going to give you a, a more holistic picture of what's going on. So how do we do this? Um, These are some, some folks at a training um, collecting a sample for the biotic index. And so we, what we use are these, these flat bottom nets called kick nets. And um, usually you stand upstream and you can see Vicki in, in the foreground here. She is kind of kicking with her feet to loosen the gravel up and the bugs and uh, aquatic snails and crayfish and other things will wash downstream into the net. And we'll do this midstream, we'll do it in riffles, we'll do it under the grass in different habitats so we can get a, a good, a broad view of the different uh, type of insects in, in the water from different habitats. Now in this photo, this is with another school group. And uh, in your, your kit that we give you uh, to head out monitoring each month, it's all tucked in a nice backpack, but we have one of these plastic tubs and they've taken the contents of one of those nets and dumped it into the white tub. And these students are using a plastic spoons, which are very handy and they're picking out the different um, bugs that they see in the water. And then with the ice cream, the, the ice cube tray next door, you can separate them into little, um, you know, compartments with, with uh, insects that look alike. So, you, you, you know, we, we like to tell the kids we're making a little zoo and uh, they go through and, and really enjoy searching through these, these samples for all the different types of critters they can find. So here's a close up of some couple in the ice cube tray. And then once, once we, uh, we have them, them uh, isolated like this, we can go through, we have a wonderful key that you'll have. And uh, it, this is, yeah, well, once again, really fun to uh, figure out what's what. And the key uh, will ask you questions, you know, does this, if we're looking at the, 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 the insect on the left there, uh, we can work through this together. I'll just read off some of the things here on the key. Uh, does this, um, sample, does this specimen have a shell or no shell? And no shell. We, thank you. <laughs> we have no shell. So we'll move to the no shell size. Does it have legs or, or no legs? It has legs. Has legs, thank you. Does it have uh, 10 or more legs, four pairs of legs or three pairs of legs? It has three pairs of legs. Okay, three pairs. Does it have wings or no wings? Uh, no wings. Okay. Does it have no obvious tails, one or two tails, or three tails? Uh, the second one, it has two tails. It has two tails. Yes. Okay. So now by um, going through it, I've reduced what it could be to six different mm -hmm. products. And looking at my chart, it looks like a stonefly larva. So, and that's what it is. So stonefly larva, we, we um, on our data sheet, 
that would uh, we check off that that that's there. It doesn't matter if we found one or if we found 50 of them. Um, once we find one, we're, okay, we've got a stonefly larva, we move on. And mm -hmm. that uh, stonefly larva is great to find. They, they live in very high quality water. And uh, so when you, when you find those, and we don't find them in every stream, in fact, uh, but when you do find the one, it's, it's, it's exciting because uh, they need old, well oxygenated water. Mm -hmm. The other uh, looks like, does anyone want to guess what the one is on the, on the, I guess it's in the middle. Uh -huh. It is a damsel fly larva. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So yeah, that's, um, Really exciting. We, I should say that this is the biotic index is something that we do twice a year. So the other, um, the temperature, dissolved oxygen, and transparency uh, and flow, those things you do every month. Um, this biotic index you do just twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And last item that we just do, this is a, the last assessment and it is something that we do just once a year. It's called the habitat assessment. And this one is distinct from the others in that it's uh, much more subjective and it's, um, you're, you're kind of gauging, looking at the, the, uh, the stream bank and giving it a, you know, a very good condition to a poor condition. You're looking at the buffer along the stream and uh, other, um, assessing other habitat along the stream. And so it's, it is a little bit more intimidating and it, uh, it's, it's something that I know our new volunteers always have the most questions about. But uh, as I said, it, it is something that we only do it once a year. It's um, on the good side, the, there, there has been a lot more resources, especially in the last couple of years, the, uh, the WAVE program has some wonderful video um, support for learning more about the habitat assessment or seeing examples and um, getting to familiarize yourself more with, with uh, how to do it. There's seven, um, seven items that you're looking at. The buffer width, the stream, bank erosion, pool, pool area, width to depth ratio, the riffle, um, the ratio between uh, the riffle or bend, find sediments and cover for fish. And you're giving them either a poor, fair, good or excellent rating. And so for this, yeah, this was gonna be something that we'll work through it at the training. And it's, it's going to be something that you'll become more familiar with just with experience and um, uh, like I say, these resources online I've, it's helped me a lot to watch some of the video presentations and getting to see examples and, and uh, looking over how the habitat has been assessed in other places. So yeah, that's, that's my last slide. And let me see if I can, oh, here we go. All right. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, sorry to jump in, Lacey. Um, 
yeah, who, who is invited to the, the way of trainings is everyone is invited. Anyone with interest in science, the outdoors, um, who wants to learn more about water quality and become connected to you know, these wonderful streams that we have in this area, you're welcome to sign up and we will have our first training next Wednesday. Um, the time commitment is, it's usually about an hour or two each month. Um, and like I say, some months you'll be doing say a habitat assessment during the summertime, might take a little bit of extra time. And the, uh, the biotic index that you do twice a year, that would be a, um, a little bit more time that month. Ideally, you will, um, for the best data, it's um, for uh, the baseline data. If you just go out, um, hey, what are we going to do today, kids? Let's go do the stream monitoring, you know, just on random days or just on sunny days. That is really less ideal than if you were to go out, say the third Wednesday, like my schedule is going to, going to be, our family is going to go out the third Wednesday in the morning and collect our data. And that'll be your primary um, day to do your water monitoring. Now things come up, um, life happens. If you go out on, you know, the fourth Thursday, Hey, that, you know, you'll put it, put in your notes, you know, this is a secondary day and just makes note that, uh, so, so we know it wasn't on, on that, that primary day, but it's, it's fine. If, if you didn't get out that month, it's not ideal, but you know, let, once again, you, we do what we can and uh, um, some data is better than no data. So let's see. Like I say, this, this data is, is available to, to everyone, whether they're in the program or, or just anyone else that wants to go on to the, the DNR surface water integrated monitoring system, you can look up and, and you want to, maybe you want to check in on your local stream and see if anyone's water, uh, you know, doing any monitoring there as, you know, at the current time, you can do that on the DNR site. And I think that's mostly it. I think I'm going to take some questions, but uh, I'll let Nan, our co-director, jump on for a moment because she wanted to also uh, offer some, some uh, current events that are coming up and some information there. Yeah, and um, should you want to sign up to be a WAVE volunteer, um, just email us at info at valleystewardshipnetwork.org. Okay. And the two training sessions are next Wednesday from, um, let's see, it's two to six and a week from Saturday on the 24th from one to five. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to thank everyone for attending and uh, also thank the library for hosting this. Um, and we hope you would be consider becoming a WAVE volunteer, or maybe know someone who would like to be a WAVE volunteer. Um, but if not, if you're not already a member of VSN, we are always looking for people to join our members. Um, and you can sign up by um, at valleystewardshipnetwork.org on our website and just click join us or just in, uh, email me at info at valleystewardshipnetwork.org. Um, if you'd like to know more about Valley Stewardship Network in general and what we've been doing, we reached 20 years last year. We were gonna celebrate our anniversary, but we didn't for obvious reasons. So this, our 21st year, we're going to have some celebration of our past and our future. Um, and on Friday, this Friday, several of uh, staff members will be talking about how VSN started and our history and what our current programs are. That's through the library as well. And it's at uh, 1030 in the morning on Zoom again. And you can uh, find the link on the library website. 
And then um, we also have a new program that we're trying to roll out uh, called uh, Go Native for Biodiversity. It's a native planting program. It was inspired in part by Doug Ptolemy's book, uh, Nature's Best Hope. And um, on April 30th at 10.30, um, VSN's board chair, Tom Lukens, will be le leading a book study, a virtual book study of the book. And he has also started a native planting program um, on an in-town site and a rural site. And so he'll talk a little bit about his projects that he's working on there. So we hope that you would join us in the library for one of those or as a member. Um, and now if you had any questions, you can unmute and just let us know what you have. So I have a question regarding where the training is at. Is that going to be in the offices in downtown Viroqua? No, it's at yep. the West Fork Sportsman's Club. Um, and if you if you email in, we'd give you the the address for it. I don't remember exactly what it is. Maybe right at Avalanche. Yes. Okay. I yeah. I think I know where that is. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll have the have it outdoors and they have a nice uh, covered open air pavilion for us to use and picking tables and then of course we'll be down on the stream uh, doing the sampling stream side. So I don't have big rubber boots like I saw in the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, or something or <laughs> we do have some rubber boots that we uh, do lend from time to time. So. Mm -hmm make sure I have some sign up for it. I'll, I'll communicate with you and make sure I bring the right size. Well, I have like garden boots that kind of go up to below my knee. Is that, is that good enough? Or is that... That, that's probably good enough for the, uh, the training and depending upon the stream that you, where you want to monitor that, that may be plenty. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you for your presentation. Sure, thank you very much. Yeah, and, be sure and to, did, yeah. did you have any questions about, or, or did you see any um, information that you thought I should have included, or? No, I thought I thought it was great. Um, yeah, okay. and, and just be sure, Dean, to email info at valleystewardshipnetwork.org that you want to sign up and, and I'll give you some additional information about location and have a couple extra questions for you that way too. Sounds great. Super. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Rice, so very much for your presentation today. Um, it's so exciting to hear how, I guess I'll speak from my own personal point of view of how I can get involved in um, preservation and conservation, or in this way of just being that citizen scientist. And I already am out at the streams and love to be out there, especially April through August or October. Yes. So I think it's just, um, I'd be so happy to participate because <laughs> it, it's just like a, another way of looking into and caretaking of this beautiful, beautiful place that we live in. Um, I think being able to put that scientific eye towards it and to find some data along the way and then be able to offer that up. So then the you know, folks and other scientists and ecologists are taking care of our environment here is just a little way that I could, I could help, so. Mm -hmm. It sounds really exciting and I'm definitely interested in being able to participate too. So I will have to send out an email there. <laughs> but thank well, you we, for, yeah. Yes, and thank, thank you. I was just gonna thank the library once again. It's really wonderful to have you all uh, available to partner with and to get the word out and that you know, mm -hmm. you're putting it on your, your YouTube page and, and mm -hmm. you can continue to access. Right, absolutely. So my thought is to mention as well here, let me add this. My thought to um, add in there as well is if anybody is, happens to be watching this uh, YouTube program or seeing it on uh, Community Channel 14, after the fact that these trainings have happened, 
Um, I would think that they would still be able to reach out to Valley Stewardship Network and just see what other programs you all have coming up, right? You have different things happening throughout the year for people to be involved in. Could you speak towards that, Nan? Absolutely. Unfortunately, this summer, usually we have a whole complement of summer programs that we won't be having this year. However, we are definitely looking to start up our conservation on tap program again nice. with a little less tap. I guess you have to provide your own. <laughs> um, and we might even start that up early because it is like, and we're going to do it virtually. I mean, at least that's the plan for now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so we can start it whenever. So keep an eye out definitely for those programs coming mm -hmm. around again. Excellent. That's so great. There is so much good um, information right out there for us. And, and we're hoping out. to celebrate our 20th anniversary a year late, but we're hoping to have some big party celebration in the fall sometime. That sounds good. We'll all have to stay tuned. So. <laughs> And, and see what's next, right? See what's around that yeah. river's bend. Yes. That's so great. Um, well, thank you again so much. Is there anything else we'd like to cover? Or we're, it seems like we'll all be uh, meeting up soon at the, at the river to have that wave training. So that's great. <laughs> that's great. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.